It is a blessing to be here this morning. Uh, as mentioned before, uh, Justin Peach, a good friend of mine, has invited me to be here this morning. My name is Joseph Mankin. I come all the way from Nashville, Tennessee. I serve at the Hillsboro Church of Christ congregation. I've been there for almost nine years, and uh, I'm glad to be here with my wife, um, who's sitting over here next to Mary Beth. Um, we have a four-year-old back at home, and we have a baby girl on the way, due next month. So we're excited about that, and excited to be here this morning. Um, my story begins uh, when, I, when I went to Lipscomb University in Nashville. I, I went there as a, as a graphic design major. I majored in graphic design, I minored in marketing, and I had this dream to become this designer uh, for, to just to do one logo, maybe change the logo of Coca-Cola and I'd be made. And just kind of go that direction and my life would be set and I'd, I'd be good forever. And so God had a different story for me. God had a plan for me to go into ministry. I interned at a few churches and then was able to have the opportunity to serve at Hillsborough and I've been there ever since. I served as a, as a designer for two years though after college and uh, uh, coming to, to Lipscomb, um, there was a lot of amenities that I was able to, uh, to gain that I didn't have when I was growing up. Well, I grew up in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, uh, not on a farm, but I worked on a farm. My father had some land that my grandfather owned and had been running for a long time. And so growing up in my home, I didn't have a microwave, which, you know, that's, that's not new technology. We, we, I didn't have a microwave. I didn't have a, a cell phone at the time. We didn't have high-speed internet. I, we only had a corded phone, if you remember what those are. And so we had a corded phone. And so if I wanted to talk to my girlfriend in high school, I'd have to stretch the cord through the living room, through my room, and all the way to that couch where I would sit down and talk to her privately. But no one knew I was on the phone because you had to trip over the cord. And so in those times of my life, I got to Lipscomb, and I had, I had internet, I had cable television, I had a cell phone, I had a microwave. I mean, things like that that were amazing to me. I was just blown away at all these things that I had. I figured out that you cannot put aluminum foil in a microwave for the first time in my freshman year of college. So a lot of things like that I was beginning to learn and understand. So as college progressed, I began to recognize that there were things in my life that I desired that I never had desired before. Facebook was created when I was in college, and I was looking at it thinking, why do I want this? And then, you know, I had this desire to connect with all of my friends with a cell phone. I was like, I desire to stay, to stay connected. I wanted this, this connection to continue. So this kind of g g gained a lot of uh, desire for those things and a lot of curiosity. And I began to understand how it was manipulating my mind and manipulating the way that I interacted, not only with my family, but with a lot of my friends. So this morning, as we, as we focus on, on the media and how it's affected not only your lifestyle, but the world that we live in, uh, I want you to understand that Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, because we understand our technology. Maybe you have it and you maybe not know everything, you, may, you maybe don't know everything about it, but for those that have cell phones, you know your cell phone probably uh, better than anybody else. Or you might know your television better than anybody else. Or you might know some form or fashion of technology better than anybody else because it's yours. But what I'm asking you this, to do this morning is to trust in what God is able to do through those things and not what they were designed in our minds for. And so this morning, I, I, we're going to be kind of focusing out of Galatians. Um, so if you have your Bibles, you can, you can uh, just kind of stay in there. Um, and, and with Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10, just kind of camp out in there for a minute. And I'm, I'm going to be reading it to you um, as we go through this. It says, in, in, starting in, in verse 6, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you have accepted, let them be under God's curse. In verse 10, this is, this is a, a key verse. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Keep those in the back of your minds as we, as we go through this. So you ask yourself, you might be thinking, like, what is media? Media is the means of communication that reach or influence people widely. 
Okay, so media is something that is around us all the time, whether you're a, an avid newspaper reader or whether you're a person that follows everyone's blog or you just have a really cool Twitter account. I don't know where you are in your lifestyle, but there, we are uh, surrounded by media on a daily basis. Today's teenagers are, uh, are surrounded 10 hours and 45 minutes a day of their life. They're uh, surrounded by this type of media, whether it's a cell phone, whether it's screen time, whether it's a TV, whatever it might be. But they are just so just poured into this, in this thing that the world is saying, you have to have it, you have to have it. Social media is so intricately woven into the lives of today's teenagers that they do not know what life would be like without it. They do not know what life would be like without it. A lot of times when I go on a mission trip, you know, I take a picture of somebody, instantaneously the, the people, even on a mission trip in a third world country, say, let me see it. Whereas years ago, you'd have to wait till you developed it, go to the dark room, put it together, and then wait till, you know, Walgreens printed it for you, and then came back and you saw it and you got to show it to everybody. But now it's instantaneous. Everybody lives in this microwave world of communication that we want this stuff right here, right now, no waiting times. So how is technology influencing your family? This may be, this is maybe the, uh, the sticker on the back of your minivan outside. You've got mom, dad, and the kids couldn't even show up to the picture, so you FaceTime them in, okay? So that's kind of how technology is influencing today's, today's world, is we realize that we only are able to connect through a device. We, we kind of are neglecting the ability to communicate face-to-face. -face. So how is technology influencing? Maybe, maybe this is you. 32% of parents think of technology like computers, cell phones, and video games as making their family life better. So I'm not here to put a negative tone on technology and media, but I'm here to encourage you to let you know that it can be used for good reasons. Some of you might say, we love to watch movies on Friday night. Some of you might say, I love to text my son or daughter a, a verse, a daily verse. Or some of you might say, I connect with family members that live across the country based on a device that I have in my back pocket. And those are all good reasons. Very, very good reasons. One of the reasons for this may be that families are including these as experiences um, for your family. Like, like I said, like TV or, or, or you're connecting through a video game. I don't know what it might be, but it's, it's in increasing this connection that we call family. Although, 49% of 11 to 17 year olds say they are not any specific times when they make the choice to disconnect or turn off technology, and 33% of parents agree with the same statement. So we understand that it's a good thing. We understand that we desire this one thing, but we also have to understand that there has to be a stop sign somewhere in our life when it comes to these things. We have to understand when it needs to be turned on or when it needs to be turned off. And so those things we have to, we have to really implement into our daily routines to make it a habit. So 33% of parents worry about technology and media wasting their children's time. I know speaking to a variety of generations in this room, a lot of times we look at a younger generation, we automatically see them on a cell phone and we think they're up to no good. You know, they're, they're hacking into something or they're, you know, putting something out there that's not worth anybody's time. And so we automatically see a cell phone and we think, man, that child is up to no good. Wasting, wasting, wasting time. But 21% of youth say that their parents have a double standard when it comes to technology. Now understand this, a lot of the habits that teenagers and young tweens, uh, children, are learning their cell phone habits from their parents. Because if you think about it, let, let's analyze a nighttime at your house. You go sit down at the table, you're eating dinner, and you, you get out, uh, dad gets out a cell phone, and he's, you know, eating dinner, eating some meatloaf, drinking some sweet tea, and going through this, and checking his email, and he, he excuses it as work, correct? He says, oh, I've got, I've got work to do, I've got to make money. Well, then your, your child sitting over here, little Johnny, is sitting right over here, and he looks at his life, and he's like, well, I want to connect with my friends. My friends are very important to me. And so that, but then he says, no, put that away. This is at the, we're at the dinner table right now. But to excuse these habits that we sometimes are, are living. Or maybe you're a stay-at-home mom, and you go take, take your kids out to Chick-fil-A, and you go eat, and you're sitting there, and the whole time while your kids are with you, you're on your, you're on your Pinterest account making sure you pin all your stuff, and then you're over here you know, making sure that your kids look just perfect in the sunlight so you can put that picture on Instagram so everyone thinks you're the perfect mom. So we put all of this together, and we realize that this is the way that our life is. Or we just make excuses and say, that's just, everyone does it, right? Why, why shouldn't we just all continue to live this, this way? Most families are not getting any coaching or assistance when it comes to integrating technology into a family life. And hopefully that's why I'm here today. This is a topic that the church has failed to communicate. 
This is a topic that the church understands. We know it's a part of our lives. I mean, my, my grandmother had a cell phone, even though she only turned it on when she needed it, so we couldn't reach her. But, we, but in, in, those, in those moments, we understand that a lot of people understand that yeah, it's becoming almost a necessity in, in today's lifestyle. But are you in control of technology, or is technolo technology in control of you? I heard a speaker say one time that all of his appointments, the people he was meeting with on a daily basis, ended up becoming times of the day. Oh, you're my 1 o'clock, you're my 2 o'clock, you're my 3 o'clock, you're my 4 o'clock. And he decided to take all of that out and just remember people by name and say, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to meet with you today, whenever you're available. Because we start to putting our schedule, depending on our schedule, as controlling our lives. Hey, what are you doing tomorrow? Oh, let me check. Oh, what do you have going on this weekend? I don't know, I've got to check my device real quick. Let me check and see if that, that, that fits with you. Because my life is more important than yours. And that's what we convince ourselves of on a, on a daily basis. So take a look at this picture and tell me if you think this is wrong. So you see this, you see, you know, the, the grandfather, he's sitting there on the computer, and he, everyone laughs, they're like, oh, that's cute. Grandpa's learning how to use a Mac, you know, it's just kind of like, oh, that, that's nice. And then you see the, the kid with his teddy bears, like, oh, you know, that seven-year-old, or however old he is, he, he's actually looking at the newspaper. That's good, that's good, that's, that's great. Let's just keep doing that. But let's, let's reverse the medium in their hands. Put the, put the uh, computer in his hands and the, and, the, uh, and the newspaper in the grandfather's hands. Well, we immediately get a negative tone. We're like, well, the kid, he's up to no good. He's on the computer. What is he doing? Is it, you know, I can't believe he's just on the computer sitting next to his grandfather. And the grandfather's reading about the news. That's, that's normal. We, we should read about the news. You know, that's, that's normal. We should keep doing that. But in reality, what if you said grandpa is actually reading the newspaper online and he's, and he's showing his son and it's the same thing? So we, we tend to look at maybe a medium that we receive our information as something that is, as, is unuseful or not, benefit, not benefiting our time. So there are eight styles of communication in today's world. Uh, one being talking, the one God gave us, you know, the, the, the voice. And so we have talking, we have video chat, which is becoming more common. Uh, we have the phone, which is something a lot of us understand. We have the letter, which is, well, some people still use those. Uh, they're nice. I, I, we really like to receive those. Texting, email, messaging, and status updates. So we have this ability to reach a lot of people or one person. And we kind of decide whether or not we want our message to reach a small group, a large group, or the masses. And so we have this dilemma on what to go with. So the, one of the things I want to focus on just for a few minutes this morning is, is, is the, the cell phone. Because the cell phone allows you to do a lot of these things, if not all of them. And so think about the age that you received your first cell phone. I remember my first cell phone was that blue one right there, and it was the coolest phone in the world because it was blue. It had the game Snake on there, and I was a killer snake player. And so looking back at that phone, also just remembering those days, um, the, the cell phone started getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And, to, and this week, I, uh, Apple's releasing the iPhone 6, and it's only getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and everybody's just going to be talking on devices like this. They're just going to be like, hello, what's up? You know, just having like this device in their back pocket that's just getting larger and larger. And so the, the, the thing about these cell phones is it's become one of the most commonly misused devices ever created. And what did we create it for? To connect with people, to connect with others, to, to, co to have conversation about things. 78% of today's teenagers own a cell phone. So students, when you go home today, you can go up to your parents and when, they say, when you say everyone else has one, you're right. And so now you can use that as leverage, you know, to get that cell phone that you really wanted. 47% on a smartphone, 23% uh, have a tablet computer, and 93% have access to a computer at home, and 71% share a home computer with a, with a family member. So the, as the numbers continue to rise and rise and rise, we understand that it's only becoming more common. So what do we do as a church? We start to push it away. We start to say, oh, no, 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 no. Get, get rid of that. Put, put it out of here. We don't, we don't need that to be a part of, of anything that we are doing. But what if I'm telling you that the message is not changing, it's just the presentation of the message is in a new form? So we have to understand that we can use this. We can use these devices for something more grand. We can reach even a broader audience. We can reach family and friends that, are, that have moved away or are far away, and we can still connect with them in a way that may not be as valuable as face-to-face, -face, but it's still a connection. And that is what technology is allowing us to do. But the question that we have to ask ourselves again is, is technology convincing a generation 
that what they want is what they get. And I think what's happened is this generation of, 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 of uh, uh, millennials, ages 13 to 30, realize that they've had this as a part of their life forever, so they only can imagine life with it. They cannot imagine life without it. So we have to teach as from a generation that, doesn't, that can't imagine life without it, we have to understand life with it so we can teach a generation on how life can be lived better with it. Because we're, it's not going anywhere. It's not going to be thrown away, as far as I know. So with this generation that are convinced by they get what they want, you have to also ask yourself another question. Am, am I raising a trophy kid? And now what I mean by this is that in today's world, you know, we play peewee sports and we play all these other uh, things, and even the last place team, 0-18, gets a trophy at the end of the season, right? I mean, are you, are you with me on this? Like, you, you, you play a soccer league, you're in a soccer league or a basketball league or a football league or whatever you want to play in, and you, and you just do awful. I mean, terrible, and everybody's, you know, still saying, you're number one, you know, congratulations. And, you, and at the very end of the, end of the season, they get just as big a trophy as the first place team did because you don't want to hurt their feelings. You want them to know they are just as good as those guys. Sometimes we've got to learn how to lose, right? Sometimes we've got to understand that we don't get a trophy for everything we get or everything we do. I understand for, in my life, I have a younger brother that's six years younger than I am. He won a lot of stuff when he was younger. I mean, he won state championships. He's got like a ring. He did basketball. He was awesome. I didn't win anything. So I'm a little bitter, okay? I'm, I'm being honest with you. I'm a little bitter. But understanding that is, is he had a lot of stuff handed to him when he was younger. And we've talked about this. He knows that I, I'll share this with you guys. And, and, and seeing that his life was a little bit different. I felt like I had to earn it a little bit more because I did not receive the trophy at that time in my life. But he did. And so are we raising these kids that we are idolizing? Are you a young parent that posts every single picture of your child and you want your child to be the most, most liked person on Instagram? The most liked child on Instagram? And I, I'll admit, there, there's times in my life that I'm very guilty of this. I'll post a picture of my son, and I'll think, oh, man, that's a cool picture. And I get a lot of likes, and I feel kind of good about myself, you know? I mean, we all do. We, we, people appreciate that. It's a, a sense of self-security, uh, of self-esteem uh, is being raised a little bit. But are we putting them up there too high sometimes so that when they fall, we're not prepared to help them in those moments? Are we raising the bar a little too high when it comes to these trophy kids that when... You're sitting at breakfast and they're 12 and you're trying to get that right light picture of them eating cereal. They're like, Mom, stop taking pictures of me. I mean, that's true. That's what's happening with these children that we're idolizing and saying, my kid's the best and my kid's the best. And as they get older, they look back at you and they think, I, don't, I didn't want you to put all those pictures of me, but I couldn't say anything because I couldn't talk at that time. So think about that. Are we raising some trophy kids in this, in this society that we're living in? So we, we live, what has happened is we live in an overprotected generation. Imagine this, uh, for, first child, like I said, I've got a four-year-old and I've got one on the way. How much time and effort did you put into monitoring your firstborn child? Think about that. For those in the older generation, it, it, was, it was, you know, stay close, you know, keep, keep the crib close to you, maybe put it in your room. Today, it's all high tech. You know, you've got a camera in there that can swivel. And it's got night vision on it, so you can see them when they're asleep. And then they go to daycare, and you've got a login, so you can have, have access to a camera at their daycare, and you can look at them and say, Johnny's doing good today. He's walking. They changed his diaper. You know, everything's good. And so we spend all of this money to analyze and to watch our firstborn child. And what happens? Child number two comes around. So then you're like, okay, well, let's just wait and make sure that all the stuff that we did previously still works. You know, as, as, but it still has a, has a plug-in, still connects to the internet. Then what happens? Child number three comes around. And so you're like, all right, child number three, um, this stuff doesn't work anymore, but child number one, he's old enough, right? He can kind of watch child number three. Then what happens? Child number four comes around, and you're like, I don't know where he's at. Child number four, um, he's somewhere here. Uh, we're all in the building. We're good, right? We're all in the building. It's, uh, we're, we're fine. And so this is an actual picture from a preschool in London. This is the way they take them from one uh, school to the next school. They hold a rope all the way down. They have a leader in the front and the back, one on the side. They're wearing reflective safety vests just so you don't miss them as they're going from one building to the next. And they just herd them like cattle all the way in to the next, next building. So are we, are we generating an overprotected generation? 
Are we, are we creating this? We satisfy our desire for safety with the purchase of a limitless device that fits in the palm of our hand. Let me say that again. We satisfy our desire for safety with the purchase of a limitless device that fits in the palm of our hand. I'm talking about a cell phone. So as your kid gets older and you think, well, we want to stay connected. We want to make sure that they are, you know, not in danger. They don't have a flat tire. They don't get bullied. All of these things happen in, in a parent's mind these days. So what's the answer? Get them a cell phone. And what happens? 96% of parents of preteens, um, uh, before you turn the age of 13, do contact their child on a daily basis. 96%. But then after that 13 age gap or age happens, there's a little disconnect there. They start to connect with other things, other places, other things such as social media. We all have something that connects to some of us somewhere, whether it's Facebook or, or Twitter or Instagram or Snapchat or whatever you might have. I'm going to be sharing some stats in a second about this, but understanding this stuff is it's, it's, a, it's creating a generation that loves themselves. It's creating a movement of people that your life is very important, and we want everyone to know how important your life is. That's why we have Facebook, right? That's why we get on LinkedIn as, as a work, so we can connect and say, my job's cooler than yours. Now, to an extent, that's an overgeneralization, but in reality, in the back of your mind, when the day's over, and you got, you got a lot of likes that day, and the day before you didn't, you can sleep a little bit easier. You feel better about yourself a little bit more because people like me, right? And what's happened from this, it's created another subset within this generation, which I refer to as the selfie generation. Now, granted, this is a, you know, a young girl taking a picture with a flip phone. That's probably not true anymore. Um, but it, it, it's, it's, it's all about I, 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 I. It's me, 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 me. I challenge you, if you have an Instagram account, go back at your account and, and just see how many pictures are directly of you. Just you. Or how many pictures are, are of you with somebody else? Or is there a picture on your account that's not, you're not in the picture? I don't know. Some people have that and some people don't. But if, it's, if you just scroll through your feed and realize, okay, it's completely about me, and you're, this realization just happened in your life, you might want to change something. You might want to put a stop sign up somewhere and realize, okay, we might need to adjust this a little bit. So I'm going to go back to the beginning verse, Galatians 1, 6 through 10. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings? Now we've got social media in our minds. Now we've got the Facebooks and the Twitters and the Instagrams and Snapchats and all that stuff. Are you trying to win the approval? Are you trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of God. And we are called to be servants of God. That's a tough verse to swallow when you really understand who we're trying to please when it comes to the accounts that we run. So here's some quick stats uh, just to let you know. Facebook, currently, over 1 billion monthly active users since March of this year. 1 billion and over 80% of Facebook users are outside the United States and Canada, just, just so you know that, over 80%. Uh, Twitter, 645 million registered users since January of this year, and 40% of Twitter uh, users don't tweet. They just follow people. Just, that's crazy. Instagram, 20 billion photos are shared per day, 1.6 billion likes per day. It's a lot of this going on, you know, just double-clicking and liking, things like that. 1.6 billion per day in Snapchat, 32% of U.S. teenagers ages 13 to 17 use Snapchat. If you have no clue what any of these are, congratulations. But if you, if you don't know what some of them are, I encourage you to come uh, to our, our, our uh, little seminar after, after church today and kind of learn more about that stuff. But the question I have for you today is, are we overconnected? After you heard the stats and heard the information from all of this stuff, it's quick and easy to say, yes, we are. Very easy to say that, right? You heard some numbers, you heard some connections, things like that. Are we overconnected? Yeah, 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 we are, we are. But what if I told you no? What if I said today we're not overconnected? 
you would think, Joseph, what, what does that mean? Like, I mean, we, we, are, we are sleeping with our phones under our pillows. We're waking up in the morning, and the first thing we do is check email. We are, we are making sure that, you know, what I wear today is going to be good for a picture with so-and-so because that will get me more likes today. Or we're going to do this. My schedule tells me I've got to do this. I've got to get on LinkedIn and connect with this person, and, and I've got to pin that because I'm, I'm making this, uh, uh, this birthday list on Pinterest, and all of these things are happening, and blah, 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 blah. We fill in the, fill in the blank with everything under the sun. But have we used it at all to glorify God? Have we used it at all to share something with someone to say, let his light shine more than my light? I mean, do we really even have a light? Is, his, is the light of God reflecting off us more than, it, than we think it is? Hopefully it is. But are we using social media? Are we using technology? Are we using these devices for something that's more that's grander than what it was designed for? What if what if a social media site got mad at Christians and said, "Man, they're just bombarding us. They're just using it too much to connect other people with God, to tell the story of Jesus." What if that happened? What if we as Christians decided that we are going to just go in and completely change what Instagram is made for? What if that happened? It would definitely impact the world because the world knows what that is, but the world may not know the Jesus that we know. So here's some simple solutions. I don't want to, I don't want to just throw all this at you and think, well, that's great. You made me feel bad about myself. I'm going to leave here depressed, and I just, there's nothing else I can do. Well, I want to give you some answers. Uh, here, here's, here's one answer. Number one, just be aware. 1 Peter 5, 8 says... Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, lion looking for someone to devour. Be aware. Be aware of what's going on in your, in your house if you're a parent. Be aware if your child has access to, to an iPad, a computer, a TV, and a cell phone all in the closed confinements of their room. Be aware that the, the channels that you have on your on your. Uh, on your Netflix account or your Hulu account or whatever you might have, your, your cable account. Be aware of the channels that you're subscribing to and paying for. Be aware of who your children follow, who you follow. Who you follow actually is a reflection of who you are, all the accounts that they have. Just be aware. Be eyes open to what it is that's around you. Number two, set limits. Hebrews 12, 11. No discipline seems pleasant at time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those that have been trained by it. Set limits. Just like when you got a, a car for the, for the first time. You're, you got the keys to it, and your, and your mom and dad probably said, go have fun, here you go. There's probably some limits, right? You probably said, well, there's a speed limit. Um, you, can't, you can only turn right after you stop at a stop sign. Um, or a stoplight if you're going right, obviously. And then, uh, and then you've got to obey the laws of the, of the, of the road, wear your seatbelt. There's limits when it comes to owning keys to an actual car. But when you hand a cell phone over to like a 9 or 10-year-old, they're just like, have fun with it. We're doing the same thing that we, we sh you know, joked about we're doing with a car. We're just giving over them a, a device that has the world in their back pocket with no limits at all. Oh, I got you the unlimited plan. You're good. We're not going to pay more money. You can text all you want, do everything you want. I had a mom sit in at a seminar with me in July, and she sat front row, and she said to me, I didn't know that an iPhone, on an iPhone you could surf the web. I said, how many kids do you have? She said, three, a fifth grader, an eighth grader, and a twelfth, I mean, an eleventh grader. And I said, do they have phones? They go, yeah, they all have the iPhone 5S. And I said, oh, sit front row and take notes, please, <laughs> as we go through this stuff. So the last one I want to uh, just let you know is set aside. Mark 1, 35 to 37. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. It's kind of like that moment where you say, We have been texting you all day long. You have not answered your phone. Where are you? Well, Jesus decided, I needed some time off. I needed to set up a stop sign and take some time to just pray with, with my Father. Are we, are we living like that? Do we know that our, these devices have power buttons? Do we know that there is a place that we can set it aside and, 
It knows how to handle itself with us walking away. Do we understand that there needs to be a need for us to turn something off when it comes to technology? Not forever, but for it to create a habit that you're not dependent upon that information. Like I said earlier, the thing we have to understand is who you follow reflects who you are. Are we following Christ to an extent that others know that we're following him? Are we following Christ to an extent that others know that we're following him? Can we look at your social media feed and know that you're a Christian? Can we follow you or contact you and look at you and everything about you and walk away and say, man, they're influenced by something that I don't know. I don't, I, I, I don't understand that. Something, something joyous, a little bit happy. There's some love involved in there. Because freedom in Christ gives us the ability to reflect Jesus, even in the small parts of life, so that others may watch, learn, and follow. With social media, we know what the word follow means. But to follow Christ requires a lot of sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice in our life. We deny ourselves, take up your cross and follow him. So are you using that today? Are you allowing this to be something that is, is, is bigger than the picture that you're painting online? And the last verse I have for you this morning is one of my favorite verses dealing with media. 2 John 1.12 I have much more to say to you, but I don't want to do it with paper and ink. For I have to visit, for I hope to visit you soon and talk with you face to face. Then our joy will be made complete. Isn't that encouraging to hear? That even though we have this opportunity to connect with so many people, even in the Bible, they're, they're still saying we need to meet face to face and understand how valuable that conversation can be. So I don't know where you are on your walk. I don't know how influenced you are by the people you follow. But I do know that today you are given a chance to follow our Creator, to follow the one and only, the one that we are created in the image of, the one that we love, the one that is love, the one that we should desire more than anything else in this world. So this morning, as, as we close, and as we, as we reflect on all this information and understanding Paul's writing to the Galatians and understanding how we, we should desire so much more than what we think we, we want in this world, I challenge you to come forward. I challenge you to, 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 to take him on in baptism, take him on if you need the, the prayers of the elders, or if you just need to, to understand that this is something you've struggled with and you just really want to kind of start something new from, the, from this moment forward. I challenge you to come forward. I also ask that you, if you need to, uh, to go visit with an elder in room 113, right, right behind those walls over there. They will be there. There will be elders in the front. They'll be there in that room. Go to where you need to go so that God can give you the message you need to hear today. So if you will, let's stand and sing. This is my desire.